Welcome to Houdini Isn't Scary, part one. Basics. This is a tutorial series which attempts to streamline the learning process behind Houdini. When I started in Houdini a couple of years back, I noticed that a lot of tutorials were too advanced and assumed a certain level of knowledge. And even now I find my own tutorials, I assume that you have a certain level of knowledge to actually follow along. But I also found that beginner tutorials were too long and boring and really didn't help me very much. That's why this series is going to cut out the excess and only give you exactly what you need to learn Houdini. Each part will add something to your knowledge and by the end of the series you'll be able to follow tutorials effortlessly and even find more efficient ways of doing things yourself. So let's begin. When you open Houdini, this is what you'll see. And I admit, it is scary. You know, there's a lot going on, there's a lot of buttons and a lot of tabs and things. However, fortunately, you can ignore most of it. When I started in Houdini, it would have helped me a lot knowing what is and isn't important. There's a lot you won't touch or likely won't need in your first 100 hours or so of using Houdini. So what is important? Let's break it down. So we have these three large panels. And this is where you'll spend most of your time. You'll be going between this panel and these two panels. And they're all linked, right? This is your viewport. This is where you can visualize things. You know, you can see what you're placing, where they're placed in space and all of that. Then in the bottom right, we have this network view. Now there's different types of networks. Depending on the process that you're currently working on, you'll use a different network. If you're putting things into your scene, you're putting objects into your scene. So you need to be on your object level. If you're giving things materials and textures, then of course you need to be in your material network. Or if you want to be rendering things out and you want to be adjusting render settings, then you would be in your output network. So for the most part, you're going to be in your object network. Next, up here, we have our parameters. And these are closely linked to what's happening down in the network below. So if we have a sphere, for example, and we want to change where it is in space, we can change its transformation in our parameters, in our settings. So quick overview. Your viewport is a visual representation of your object network. Your parameters are the settings for that object network. So these three are very closely linked. And that's why you'll often just be moving between these three. So next we have these two panels at the top and bottom. This top panel makes up your shelf tools. So it looks like a lot, and that's because it is. It's everything inside of Houdini. Everything that can possibly be made is here in some form or another. So you can take things from here and place them directly into your scene. Basically, it's just giving you access to everything in Houdini in a single panel. Now down at the bottom, we have our timeline and our playback settings. This is where you'll find your frame rate, so your frames per second, your number of frames, so the length of the timeline, your keyframes, and everything pertaining to time. So just like in real life, as this timeline progresses, things happen. And much like in real life, they only happen if there's something driving them. So we'll get to that later. Those are called dynamics. Dynamics are things driven by your timeline. So that's what makes your timeline important, is that it drives dynamics. That makes up everything that is important for us at this point, right? Our viewport, our parameters, our networks, our shelf tools, and our timeline. These are the only things that we really need, really just starting to get to grips with Houdini. Now that we have an understanding of what each of these are, let's break them down a little bit further so that we can understand them a lot better. Starting with our viewport. So on the left hand side, you'll notice that we have some of these selectable tools. These are our selector and handle controls. So this is everything for manipulating this viewport. If you want to move things around or if you want to navigate in this viewport, you use the options on this side. So to begin with, by default, you have this camera selected, and this is your view tool. This allows you to navigate your scene. So when you have your view tool selected and you left click, you'll notice that you tumble around or rotate around your scene based on a particular pivot. So we're pivoted at the origin, 
and we're tumbling around that origin. If you click and hold the middle mouse, you'll notice that it tracks up, down, left, and right. And if you right click, you'll notice that you dolly in and out, and this can also be achieved by the mouse wheel scroll. And then if you ever end up in an odd position, you know, where your axes are mixed up, you can press G to return to this home view. And this is the home angle, where X is your horizontal axis, Y is your vertical axis, and Z is your depth. So if you're not using your view mode, chances are you'll be using this transform handle. So if you click on the transform handle, you'll notice this blue text at the bottom. Select the geometry, then choose an operation to perform. So in this case, we don't have any objects in our scene, so there's nothing for us to transform or move around, in other words. That's why we don't see any transform handles. However, if we now try to either tumble, dolly, or track, you'll notice that it doesn't work. It now has a selection for left mouse, a selection for middle mouse, and options when you right click. To return to your view mode temporarily, you can hold spacebar, and that will allow you to do all those things again. Left click, middle mouse, and dolly with the right click. You can also press G while holding space, so space plus G to recenter. You can also press escape, and that'll switch you back to your view mode. Next, we're gonna move on to this right panel in our viewport. These things on the right are our display options. So these are things that change what is showing in our viewport. For example, how the lighting appears, if our materials are visible, whether our points are visible, whether our point normals are visible. So this basically deals with visualization. This is how things are visualized in the viewport. For example, you can switch off your reference grid, your Cartesian plane, by clicking on this display reference plane or orthographic grid, and that removes it, right? These are all the options that you have over here. Over here, we also have perspective and no camera. We'll get back to this no cam at a later point because this deals with cameras and lights and we're not going to be dealing with that just yet. However, this perspective over here, if you click, you get a drop down, and you can say set view, perspective, top, front, right, UV, bottom, back, left. But you can also achieve this with numbers or your numpad. So you can press one for perspective, two for your top viewport, three for your front viewport, four for your right viewport, or five for the UV viewport. So most of the time we'll be in perspective viewport. So just press one to go back to perspective viewport. And if you double tap any of them, you'll get the reverse. So if you double tap your top viewport, you'll get your bottom viewport. If you double tap the front viewport, you'll get the back viewport. If you double tap your right viewport, you'll get your left viewport. So those are the basics of your viewport. As we go through this tutorial series, I'll be introducing you to more and more of these options, but those are the basics for navigation. Now, on the right-hand side, in our network view, I told you that we have different types of networks. So I'm just going to show you those quickly just so that you know they exist. As you can see, it says OBJ over here. If we click on it, we can change it to image, we can change it to channels, materials, output, shop. Each time you change this, the parameters context changes with it. So we're going to go back to object, so just click on OBJ. So let's actually create an object for our object network. To do that, we go up to our shelf tools and we can click on sphere. So when we click on the sphere, you can see that we get this wireframe bounding box. And this represents our sphere. So if we click anywhere in the scene, it will place it there. Or if we press enter, it will place it at the origin. So with our sphere object placed at the origin, you'll notice a couple of things. Firstly, we have a sphere. And this sphere is this object that we see in our object network. We have this node over here. This is a node. And you can see it says sphere object one. Above it, we now have parameters. We have options and settings, such as scale or rotation and translation. We also have these transformation handles. Because we have switched from this view mode to our transform mode. So if you click and move this along, you'll notice that it changes its position in space. But also on our parameters, the translate changes. Right? This is its x position in space, and it is now at minus 1.2. If we press Ctrl Z, it will undo it. 
And remember, we can always just press spacebar to move around in our scene. But now that we have this object in our object network, how do we make further changes to it? Because clearly these parameters are quite limited. And the best way to think of this is as if this is a container for everything inside. So if we want to make changes, we need to make changes to the things inside, right? So if we double click on the sphere object, it takes us inside where we have a sphere. So as you can see, we're now in the object network, but the level that we're on is the sphere object one level. And as you can see, it now says geometry over here. If you go back, it says object. If you double click in here, you'll see geometry. So from here, we can make changes to the sphere. As you can see, we have new parameters to play with. We have rows, columns, primitive types, all of these things, and you can play around with these and see what they do. But what we're going to do is we're going to add more nodes to our sphere object one. So now let's maybe give this sphere some color. So we can press tab while hovering over our network view. And this brings up our tab menu. Our tab menu brings up every node that's possible to use in our current context. So our current context is the geometry level, we're working at the geometry level. So we have access to a certain number of nodes. For example, if we type color, you can see that we get this color node. We click on that and we place it over here. And now our parameters have changed once again. Over here, we have some options and we can ignore most of them because the only one that we really want is this color option. So click on this white block and it brings up a color editor. So we'll just select a blue color and then we can close it. Now, nothing's changed. Why is that? So now what we need to do is we need to connect our sphere to our color. This is the way nodes work. We connect the output of our sphere into the input of our color. And if we hover over the input of our color, we can see what it's asking for. It's asking for a geometry to color. So that's exactly what we've given it, but nothing's changed. The reason being is our display flag. As you can see, when we hover over a node, it brings up a bunch of these buttons. As you can see, we have this blue one on our sphere. Now this blue one, is what's known as the display flag. It's what is currently being displayed and it can only be on one node inside of your geometry network. So if we want to visualize our color, we have to switch our display flag by clicking on the blue display flag. So there we go, we now have our color. And so we can add things to this. If we press tab and drop down a transform node, we can plug our color into our transform node set our display flag on our transform, and then we can scale it down. So a really great way for adjusting parameters in Houdini is to middle mouse on the word. So hover over the word, middle mouse, and it will bring up this. And you can move up and down. And what this does is it allows incremental adjustments. So if we go over here and then move to the right, it will increment it up by 0.1 or down by 0.1. And if we move up, it will increment it up by one or down by one and so on. So you can make really fine adjustments by switching between these. What we're going to do is we're going to middle mouse over the Y scale and reduce it. So we're making, you know, a smarty. And so we have this flying saucer shape now. Now, the amazing thing about Houdini is that it's procedural, which means that we can change things higher up the chain and it'll still work. So we can go to our color node, and if we don't like it being blue anymore, we can change it to pink, and it'll keep its transform. But more than that, we can even go up to our sphere, and we can change this over here. So perhaps we decrease the columns. We end up with this triangular shape, but it maintains the color and transform. So now that we have that, we can go back up to our object level, and you'll see that we have this sphere object over here and what it contains has now changed. It now contains three nodes, but because it just acts as a container, it still shows as one node at your object level. All changes were made inside of this node. So that means that we can place other objects into our scene, right? So if we want a box, we can either click on our shelf tools or even in our network view, we can tab and type box. That allows us to place a box and it places it at the origin. And then we can go inside of this box by double clicking on it and change its size. So maybe you want to make this a tall thin box. 
And as you scale that down, you'll notice that our sphere is still ghosted. It's still showing up. And that's because of this option in the top right of our viewport. We have this ghost other objects option. So this sphere can't be changed from here because we're now inside of our box object, right? But we can still view it. This just makes it easy to move things in your scene. For example, it would be difficult to know where other things are. And if we wanted to say transform our box, so let's drop a transform node, how would we know where it should be? That's why the ghosting is useful. You can transform this around and still be able to see all of the objects in your scene. So this is extremely useful for visualizing both objects at the same time, because at times you may have many objects in your scene and you want to position them relative to each other. So now, as I've said before, you can only have your display flag on one of your nodes in your geometry context. However, if we go back up to our object level, you'll notice that we have two display flags active, one on our sphere and one on our box. And it makes perfect sense if you think about it. You can have many objects showing in a scene, but each object can only represent one node, right? So for example, if we go inside of our sphere object, it is a representation of the final node in this chain because that's what we have displayed. And you can switch your display flag back up to the sphere, go up a level, and now it's displaying a completely different thing, right? So where your display flag is changes what you see. And you can hide objects at the object level. And so that's it for the basics. These are the absolute basics. In the next tutorial, we're gonna pick it up a bit. We're going to be creating a donut that will be released soon. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, I'll get to those. And if you like this tutorial, please let me know. Any feedback is immensely useful so that I know whether this is a worthwhile series to pursue. And if so, I'll keep doing it. So thanks for watching. Please consider leaving a like and subscribing and leaving a comment and I'll see you next time. Bye.